Well, it's a marvelous night for a moon dance with the stars up above in your eyes. A fantabulous night to make romance neat the cover of October skies. I'm Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14, Lunar Mantra pilot. Oh yes, well all of the, uh, I took memorabilia for family and friends and some of the astronauts. And of course all of our data that we collected since we were the first science mission. <clears throat> and to collect data we collected 90 some pound, 95 pounds of lunar materials to bring back for the geologists to examine. So all of that made it very important, a lot of fun. Well, virtually everything computer code that we had to use or put in, we had it written somewhere. I didn't have to memorize it. But the uh, main thing was being prepared to uh, correct anomalies, things that, are, that occurred that uh, we needed to correct, like equipment failing. And we had checklists for all of that. But we had a number of those things happen that we had to go into emergency mode in order to uh, Keep going. I think all of us agree it's, it smells like gunpowder, that it's a, a sulfur, it's, it's lava rock that's uh, been pummeled into the consistency of talcum powder, but it comes right out of the center of the moon and it has a lot of sulfur in it, so it smells like uh, gunpowder. Well, the moment of exhilaration was when uh, we had to reset the radar, and all of a sudden when we had reset the radar, the computer, we were right on path anyhow. So we were in great shape, we just didn't know it. We had the radar to confirm it, but that was, that was a nice feeling that we knew we were right on target. I can't remember what they were, but they're recorded somewhere in the record. Well, I didn't do that from the lunar surface. That was done in orbit, rather in orbit and flight between the moon and the Earth. And it was conducted exactly the same as had been done in laboratories in several parapsychology laboratories over the years, exactly the same protocol. <clears throat> and uh, I simply used their protocol that had been done before. I had a knee pad with uh, columns on it where I could randomize the uh, numbers and the symbols, the so-called uh, Zinner symbols, and uh, orient them randomly and think about them for 15 seconds and uh, then uh, take, them, take them back and let the people who were on the ground receiving it, see it wasn't in, on the moon, it was in flight, and let the people on the ground that were receiving it at stated times, they sent me their answers, and I turned both my, my thoughts and my data and their answers over to the expert, Dr. J.B. Ryan and Dr. Carlos Osis in New York, both of whom worked in the laboratory of these things continuously. And our results were just as good as they were getting in the laboratory, but it was from, uh, from 150 to 240,000 miles away. Well, it was a little frustrating, but the fact is, for all intents and purposes, we, had, we were at the edge of Cone Crater. What was disappointing was we didn't get to look over the edge and look down into Cone Crater. But the data that we collected uh, was clear right at the edge of the cone crater, including all the samples from deep inside, <clears throat> deep inside the crater that had been thrown out onto the surface around the edge of the crater. So the only the only thing was our uh, disappointing was our inability to peer down into the crater and see the hole there. Well, we had. And we had like picking on sunglasses or taking sunglasses off 
it uh, made a little clearer view. But the fact is, it was so bright that you needed that that uh, c coloration. I don't know, recall that there was any sound to reentry. <clears throat> there was the visual effect of the heat shield turning up, burning off globs of um, molten material, mm -hmm. and it's sliding back past the uh, window of the spacecraft but I don't recall any sound that I noticed. The main thing I say to young people that I talk to about science and our lack of knowledge is that we think we're pretty smart in the 21st century here, but we're actually as far as knowledge and how the universe is put together, we're just barely out of the trees. So there's so much more to learn that we haven't learned. And we don't have the really but limited knowledge on getting beyond Earth, even to Mars or to the asteroid belt, and certainly out of the solar system with manned vehicles. That's in the future, so there's a lot more to learn. Well, I have have favorites in all of those, but uh, I can't, I'm not sure I could pull them up off the top of my head right now. I, could, I read a lot, I listen, I used to listen a lot to music and to uh, uh, video. Uh, these days I'm more interested in future science where we still don't have the data, and I spend a lot of time doing that. My childhood heroes were uh, Charles Lindbergh, for one, and uh, going back deeper in history, the explorers like Lewis and Clark, exploring across the United States, and then um, Christopher Columbus and Magellan, because they were all explorers, and that seems to have been a, a hidden thought in my mind <laughs> of being an explorer, I, but I didn't think about going to the moon at that time. Well, uh, let, let's start with when I was selected to be in the astronaut program. I was having dinner with my wife and daughters in Los Angeles, California, where we lived at the time, and I was on duty out at Edwards Air Force Base. <clears throat> when I was selected with, from, for the uh, Apollo 14 mission, actually that was not a great surprise, because in those days our protocol was you serve backup crew on a mission, and that was kind of a training assignment, and that sets you up to be <clears throat> a prime crew three flights later. So I served backup on Apollo 10, and that meant that I would be ready and <clears throat> be prime on Apollo 13. However, I was back up with Gordon Cooper on Apollo 10, and he uh, chose to retire from the program at that point rather than go on. Alan Shepard had been grounded with a Meniere syndrome, an inner ear problem, and he had that <coughs> fixed. And he was ready to come back on duty, and he applied to take Gordon's place. And that was granted to him by Houston. But the, uh, so we were at the Apollo 13 crew. However, headquarters in Washington said, Alan, you have not been in the training loop for a while. Best you take a little more time. So they negotiated a switch. We took Apollo 14, they took 13. Uh, the Apollo 14 guys took 13. They got a bad machine, we got the good machine. However, so we ended up flying the Apollo 13 flight. We just called it Apollo 14. I knew that Alan Shepard was going to hit the golf ball. I didn't know it until late in the game, but um, when he pulled out, well, I, he'd already said so, but before he pulled it out, when he pulled it out, I thought, okay, now's the time. And uh, uh, he hit the three different golf balls. One of them he finally got and got it into the air. And of course, hitting a golf, using a golf club on the end of a uh, 
piece of equipment designed for something else uh, was quite a task, and particularly one-handed since he couldn't get both hands on the golf club. Uh, <clears throat> so it was a, a feat to be able just to get it in the air at all. Well, it popped up there a bit, and he said miles and miles. But I took that opportunity to grab the uh, staff from the solar wind experiment, which was just a, a long staff, and threw it after his golf ball, and was able to throw it about four to six inches further than his golf ball. So the first Lunar Olympics of one golf ball and one javelin throw uh, goes to the javelin. <laughs> and uh, uh, as we, when we came back for, to Earth and we're on lecture tours together and people ask about the golf shot and how far did it go, it was miles and miles and then miles and miles and miles and then miles and miles and miles and miles. And miles. After about the first miles and miles, I'd say, uh, I'd say, Alan, the miles and miles is quite enough for 50 feet. <laughs> <laughs>